pull out something from his Wikipedia page, which is quite long, but so I'll be quite brief. Don't worry, but, um, don't worry. <laughs> I'll start with uh, where he was born. <laughs> he was well, born. He grew it's going to take a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he grew up with four brothers in Tikorangi, Taranaki, where his parents had a general store. But he, uh, he had his uh, medical degree from Otago, followed with the <coughs> PhD and Doctor of Science from the University of Auckland. And the rest is the history, right? So, <laughs> so I will not spend any more time on introducing him, but I'll let him speak. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for geek. Is that coming through? Is that all right? Is it? Well, it's only a, quite a small room, so it's fine. So it's a real pleasure to be here and just to give you a little bit of an overview of um, a journey, really, and tell you the story of my journey over 40 odd years. Just picking out, but it's, it's, it will follow in a very general way, um, and tell you a bit about some of the excitement that I've been privileged to be involved with. You know, growing up in a little town, little, well, it wasn't even a town, it was a, a rural area where my mum and dad had their general store, and they taught us some wisdoms, the wisdom about life, which, um, despite all my degrees and all the rest of it, they actually had more wisdom than what I'd, I'd just love to have the wisdom they had, because they taught us a couple of really important principles. One was, and being in a general store, you see, we were involved, five boys, of delivering the groceries to all the people in the community. We got to know them. And my dad always said, you know, people are the most important thing in life. It's all about people. We're on earth to look after people. And so never forget that. And so, and so, and that's been, that's been actually very important for our research. And the other thing which they told us, um, neither of them went to high school. They had to, well, they went to the first year and they had to come home and look after their families on the, on the farm and my mum in New Plymouth and... But they said, you know, whatever you do in life, follow your passion, follow your heart, and enjoy it, and just do it. But, you know, do it for the good of people, and no one is any more important than anyone else. Everyone is very special in their own particular way. And after 40 odd years in brain research, I realised that more than ever. And so those... Those couple of general ideas, plus all the other things that you learn when you, from your mum and dad, which stay, keep you in good stead, are, are the most critical things in life. I was a pretty quiet, um, you know, a bit of a nerd probably. I love reading books. I loved looking at seeing how things worked. I remember I made a crystal set and um, to hear the radio, you see, and I built it myself. With then went to see the electrician across the road and. And uh, he let me pull radios apart, and I built a new radio from uh, all the spare bits and pieces. And, and uh, so doing th those are the most exciting things I did in life, and in the most amazing ways. And, uh, um, and, and learning, when I learned how the internal combustion system worked, and you know, the cars worked, and they have these valves, and they have a camshaft so that the inlet valves let the let the vaporised petrol in just the right time, the, the, the um, other valves let the exhaust gases out and so on. When I, felt, I thought that was absolutely amazing, you know. A, so these things turned me on in life and they, in a way, it's about, that's, well, it's happened when I saw the human brain for the very first time. I was a third year medical student, I was 21, I was at Otago, and in 1966 this happened. And, and I met the two loves of my life. First, my wife, <laughs> Diana, and uh, love of my life and the you know, woman of my dreams and it's getting better and better every year. So that's the first love. And the second love was the human brain. And pity for her, but she's had to be on this ride with me. So, um, and the human brain, I just, when you look at it there, the marvels, the complexity of it is, is, is incredible. And, and when you... Um, appreciate the complexity. So we had this huge task every Saturday morning when I was at medical school. We, two of us, would, we'd have a fixed human brain between us. We'd meet every Saturday morning between 10 and 12 and we did a slow dissection of the human brain and got to see inside the brain and saw and started to get an appreciation. And for me, I just thought this is the most wonderful organ in the human body, the most wonderful wonderful thing in life in a way because you know every one of you here today is you're here 
because of your human brain. It's, and um, if you learn anything, it's your brain. That's where you store it. And you're moving, every time you move a limb, every time you feel something, every time you get a kiss on your lips when you read and write, what you see, colours, memory, everything. You fall in love. When you fall in love, you don't fall in love with your heart, you actually fall in love with your brain. You know, it's the brain that does the falling in love. Um, so for me, that was incredible. And so seeing it as a third year medical student, I decided to take a year out and do research. Um, and this was 1966, the later part of 1966. And the year I spent doing research as a medical student changed my life forever. Now you can't do experiments on the human brain, so you have to use the rat brain, you see. And so I had this wonderful job, I had a wonderful, demo, wonderful supervisor, John Carmen, who came professor up here, head of the anatomy, and, and Professor Bill Adams, head of anatomy. And um, they were wonderful mentors who just let me loose in a little lab at the top of the medical school. And um, I developed a, a little machine to put lesions in the rat brain, in the basal ganglia, knocking out a few brain cells and seeing what the degeneration was and then staining it with special silver solutions and tracing the fibre connections. And we set out to look at a particular pathway, a pathway which is thought to be involved with Parkinson's disease. It's called the nigrostratal pathway. We never found that pathway, but we found a completely different one. The one which went from the Niagara to the thalamus, a completely new pathway. And that took me to a conference in Australia to talk about it. We got four papers out of that in the year, and um, I worked sort of around the clock, and it was, I was in bliss. And the satisfaction of doing that, you see, it was totally unexpected. Everything I found was unexpected in a way. And my whole life is unexpected, actually. <laughs> you know, all the opportunities that come up, and you just follow your nose. And I always say, if a door opens, just close your eyes and walk through it. Take a risk. Just do it. And that's what happened to me. And so, um, and so that year was a wonderful year. Um, so I finished the Bachelor of Medical Science, talked to Bill Adams and said, Professor, I said, I'd like to do a PhD. He said, no, you go back and finish medicine. And then you come back and do a PhD. And it was the best words ever, best advice ever. Because I went back and completed the medical course. I then became a house surgeon here in Auckland. I spent some time in neurosurgery. Because that neurosurgery was my other option. You see, I thought I was going to do neurosurgery or brain research. Um, and if any of you get the privilege of looking and being involved with a, a neurosurgical operation, it is incredible how you can remove the skull, how you can look at the brain, which contains that whole person, um, repair an aneurysm, take a tumour out, um, and then close it up and the person is, uh, gets better. <coughs> Not always, but generally gets better. Um, I, I realised then, though, that I didn't pursue neurosurgery because we could only work on the outside of the brain. We didn't, in fact, you didn't have to know a lot about how the inside of the brain worked because you were constrained to just working on the outside. You couldn't go inside the brain and change it. We couldn't do deep brain stimulation or anything like that at that stage. And so I then went back and decided to actually start a career in brain research and did a PhD at the University of Auckland here, the first PhD in the medical school on the brain. John Carmen had just taken over as head of the department and I had another lad to set up. No, nothing was working. I had to set up all the techniques myself. It was incredible. And he ended up actually studying the cerebellum, the bit at the back of the brain, studying all the pathways out of the cerebellum and where they went. And that took me around the brain. And um, I didn't intend to do that initially, but one thing led to another. I won't tell you the whole story, but just I, I suddenly got to explore the whole brain by tracing these degenerating pathways after putting lesions in the cerebellum, you see. Finished my PhD, got a Harkness Fellowship and took me to the United States for, well, three and a half years and worked with colleagues at, M at um, in, in San Francisco, at actually at the NASA Ames Research Center at the time when they were just developing Skylab and mar marvelous, um, interesting time I had there. But looking at the pathways there, which are involved with balance, which are involved with astronauts in space, they have vomiting problems, they have motion sickness problems. So he was working on that, but his main interest was basal ganglia. So I learned a lot about basal ganglia from him. And then I went 
doing my tea in Harvard and Boston work with the person that trained him, was Professor Wally Nauta, who was the leading neuroanatomist of the day, and he invented the techniques for, for tracing pathways, the silver degeneration method for tracing fibre pathways, which was pretty hot stuff then, but not so hot now. <laughs> Um, but I learnt new techniques there where you could actually inject chemicals, inject things into the brain like horseradish peroxidase and see them taken up and taken back to the cell bodies of origin, what we call the exoplasmic techniques, you, the tritiated leucine and proline that you would inject in and then, trace, then that would be taken up by the brain cells and traced along the axons that go to the terminal parts and you cut the brain up of the rat and then you would look and see where those fibre pathways left. So these were revolutionary techniques in those days. So um, came back after a wonderful time in the United States, set up my little lab here at Auckland uh, Medical School with John Carmen and, um, and I was a senior lecturer and studying the rat brain, studying the basal ganglia. And something happened that changed my life forever. Because you see, the area I was studying was the basal ganglia, the substantia nigra and the striatum, areas involved with Huntington's disease. And, um, and then the, I was visited by the professor of um, genetics. And he came to see me and said, listen, I look after all the families in New Zealand with this terrible disease of the basal ganglia called Huntington's disease. It's caused by a single, it's caused by a gene. We don't know what the gene is. And it's a clinical diagnosis and said all these families throughout the country want to know whether or not, because we can't test it, they want to know is this disease really in their family because if it's inherited as a dominant gene, it has huge implications. Would you look at the brain of their mum and dad after death for them and see whether or not they actually have Huntington's in the family? And so he told me all about the symptoms of the disease, it's a rare disease, it has variable symptoms, motor and mood symptoms. They're mixed, they, they vary, some are mainly motor, some are mainly mood, and some are mixed, and it's a dominant genetic disorder, which is a great tragedy. And this is the area of the brain which affects the basal ganglia, the striatum, and the um, um, lenticular nucleus. And when you look at the brain at post-mortem, this is what you see. It's a characteristic compared with the normal brain. And you can tell um, if you do special stains and look at it and do special sections, you can actually diagnose it precisely using post-mortem tissue and you can tell the families. So um, I started as part, in addition to the work I was doing on the rat brain, I started looking at the human brain for families. And you know to communicate the information back to the families and tell them. In most cases it was yes, some was no. But just talking to the families and I found out all about the disease, all about the symptoms, all the tragedy that this disease causes families and boy that's pretty humbling. And they were so appreciative, they said, you know, keep the brain and do research on it. And that's what changed my life. That started me doing research on the human brain. We didn't have any, have any ethics committees at those stage. The ethics we had, the consent I had was from the families. They all wanted me to do this. And so we oh, became the custodian of their mum or dad's brain. And I started doing research on it. And so over the years, we collected brains from out, all over the North Island, all over the South Island. Um, we maintained contact with the families. We went back and got more information on their symptoms. We talked to the doctors who looked after the families to get more information. And because the families were so committed to the research, they would make sure we get it soon after death. And so we were, this was incredibly high quality brain tissue. The greatest quality though is that for every brain we received, the families would give us the clinical history and that we found out ultimately was, was going to make a difference because when we started looking at the brains, I always call this the gift of the human brain. It's the most incredible and valuable gift to research you can ever have. It's, it changed my life and it had a huge effect on my research over the coming years. And so when you look at the Let's get this going. So we looked first at the area of the brain which is most affected called the striatum. And we started doing all sorts of different types of stains. But one principle came through very quickly. When we started doing stains, 
this case is scan A receptors, but this is what the normal brain looks like, a normal section for a person who died without Huntington's disease. And this is from one who died with quite advanced Huntington's disease. And when you see, you see there's a pattern of degeneration here. There's these little holes here, areas where there's very low concentration of receptors which are clearly lost. In other brains we found the opposite pattern where we had islands left intact, but the background, which we call the matrix, was actually lost. And so we got this variable result. None of the textbooks said anything about that. They said it was just a, a homogeneous disease. Well, it's not homogeneous, we found. And when you compare those two extremes, those that have these what we call striosomes lost, and those that have the striosomes intact, but the matrix loss is two completely different patterns. For me, with the knowledge of what's going on in the basal ganglion and in the rat brain, we were immediately struck by the fact in the animal brain, you see, these compartments, striosomes and matrix, had been studied. And there was a study in incredible detail looking at the pathways going to each of these, and, and the one going into the matrix was thought to be more associated with the control of movement, and the one going into the patches were thought to be controlled more by pathways from the limbic system, anxiety, mood area. So, so I teamed up with a, neuro, a psychologist, neuropsychologist, associate professor Lynette Tippett and her team, and I said, listen, we need to collect the history, the detailed history of all the brains that we've collected. At this stage, there's about 45 brains. Um, the 35 were included in this study, to know what is the difference. Maybe what we're seeing here has something to do with the symptoms. Cut a long story right short, 10 years work in this. We found that the cases who had mainly mood symptoms and not motor, they lost the striosomes, you see. That's where the cells were dying, that's where the receptors were lost from, that's where the cells were lost from. Whereas the cases that had mainly motor symptoms, they had the matrix affected and the striosomes were, were pretty intact. <coughs> so suddenly, what we had done by studying the human brain and disease and looking at the symptoms, looking at the profile of the patients, the people who died with the disease, we had worked out that we have compartments in the human striatum which are associated with different functions. So, you see, we couldn't have done this. You can't do experiments on the human, but by studying the diseased brain and studying the post-mortem brain, knowing the, knowing the background of all the history of the family, of the patients, of the people who gave whose brain you were looking at, knowing those clinical symptoms, we could actually unravel the function of the basal ganglia in the most, in the most general but critical way. And I've just shown you two extremes. There, there are lots of variation between, even within the same family, there was a variation, even though they had the same gene, they have the differences. And those differences are shown by the pattern of degeneration. So unconsciously, the family isn't asking me to do a job, had actually configured my career. And I changed completely to working on the human brain. We, we began to understand the variation, what these, the variation in symptoms was all about. We understand the pathology, how it varied, um, and it was correlated with the symptoms. And when you look at it, you know, when a patient looks at you and shows you symptoms, they're telling you in a secret way what's happening in their brain. And that's not revolutionary, it's pretty obvious in a way, but, but it was actually quite revolutionary for us. So this ended up with rewriting the textbooks, you see. But it was a collaboration between not only those of us who are studying the chemistry of the brain, cell death and all the rest, we talked to psychologists, we ended up talking to geneticists, Russell Stell, so we began to talk to lots of other scientists to understand it. We had to talk to the doctors to get the history and to get the background from the families, and of course the families were the critical components. So in a way, you see, when my mum and dad said, people are the most important, they were the most important, and that was reinforced in so many ways. And so from those small beginnings on Huntington's disease, we have expanded and 
look at Parkinson's, look at people who have died with Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, epilepsy, right to, to today. This is, this is a range of diseases we look at from families who give brain tissue to us to study in the lab. It's not, it's, it's not just for our group, it's for any group who wants to do research on these diseases. And the community organisations support this in the most special, incredible way. That's a look inside the human brain bank where we actually do receive the tissue, we lock it up and cut it in the most special way. Look at the side of the brain, we actually cut each hemisphere down, we're looking at the lateral side, looking at the medial side, and block it into 120 blocks per brain. All catalogued, all stored, and because we know the history of, of that particular person who died with that disease, that makes us the most unique boutique human brain bank in the world and gives us an edge on every other group internationally. And I'll show you a list at the end of the, all the groups that we've worked with. So we have um, now, we, you know, the brain bank's been supported by Neurological Foundation for 25 years. It's incredible. We just agreed to see an increased funding from it. So we've got tissue from um, over a thousand brains and 45,000 blocks carefully documented and stored. And that is a library of human brain tissue which belongs to the families but which we have the great privilege to work and study and research and that is marvellous. So this is what it's all about. You see, it's about teams working together, partnering with the community in the most, in the most incredible way. Um, and so <clears throat> we wanted to develop this team research more. Over the years, we've had interact with lots of people and lots of, lots of different brain researchers across the University of Auckland, across New Zealand, across the world. But um, and we wanted to try and see, can we use this to form a creative environment? Um, while I called. So we thought, well, we should make a club. Call it the All Blacks of Brain Research, you know, in the University of Auckland. And so we called it the Centre for Brain Research. So 10 years ago, come November this year, we formed the Centre for Brain Research. Um, and it was, a, it was a centre which was built on the principles which I've sort of talked to you about. It was a centre which really consisted of the researchers in the university, people doing brain research. It f involved also the clinicians in the hospital selling people and looking after people with brain disease, and I'll take a show those in a moment. And of course right in the middle is the community. And the research at the university is very interesting. We started off in 2009, and there were 25 groups in the university who were doing brain research who we got together in the initial centre. Today, there's 84 groups. Why? Because they suddenly, we suddenly realised what team research is about. People who were doing it wanted to join up and become associated with us. So this centre goes across the university. It's open to anyone who's interested in brain and does brain research, you know, whether looking at effects of dance on dementia, looking at aspects of sports science, looking at genetics, looking at psychology, and there's a whole, I never realised there was so much brain research being done. And it covered, I've just got a few of the areas written down here, you see. And we added up these 450 researchers. If someone had told me when I started at the University of Walking to the Senior Lecturer, in 1978, said, listen, you've got to go and form a centre for brain research, this is what you've got to do, I would have run a mile. So, <laughs> you know, doing things and just following your nose, we've got, and it's the most marvellous thing, I mean, that's why I cannot wait to get to work every day because of this. And um, the, all the clinicians, you see, all the neurosurgeons, all the neurologists, all the, the these, are, they all wanted to do, join up the, we had the neuroradiologists come and see me some years ago, why aren't we on your list, you know? And so that enables us to do research with them on all the different types of therapy which are, which are being developed. We had a, I had a morning uh, breakfast meeting this morning with, one of the, with Alan Barber, the Chief Head of Neurology. We're planning a, a, a new development which are going to bring the clinicians and our scientists closer together. Um, and so it's a, uh, it's a marvellous association. And having worked in neurosurgery as a young house surgeon, I kept in contact with the neurosurgeons and the neurologists over the years, so, so it became a natural thing to do, you see. It wasn't rocket science in a way. Um, and then, of course, our community partners, all the different organisations 
which are involved with looking after people with brain disease who are partners with us in terms of our donor package. We go out and give lectures, we support them, we invite them in when we have brain day and all the rest of it. Um, they, are, they are critical and I'm patron for my sins, I'm patron of about half of those associations. So it's a, um, it's a pretty exciting sort of opportunity to, work, to do research and partnership with all the people in, who are studying science across the university with the families and being able to involve and, and push back the frontiers in an interesting way. So because of time constraint, I'm going to give you three examples of some of the really interesting results which, are, which have, where we have made an impact, our teams have made an impact across the centre and where we're continuing to make an impact. And then I'll just mention in the final analysis how we get the funding to support that and what we do. What is it that we do to try and do things that um, if we wrote an application to the Health Research Council would be too, be too preliminary and too exciting for them to fund because it would be, be sort of over the, I say over the cutting edge. You've got to get more data than you want to get it funded. So um, three examples of innovative research. Well, we've known since the 1960s that the rat brain um, there's been a number of groups who've showed us that the rat brain contains, contains stem cells in the adult brain. And if you look at the rat brain, take a section through it, we know those stem cells lie in a layer right around the ventricular margin. So these are stem cells left over from when the rat was an embryo and they still remain in their stem cell-like state. And we know in the rat that this layer of subventricular cells proliferates and makes new immature brain cells which follow a pathway here from Auckland to Wellington down through the front of the forebrain out towards the olfactory bulb where those neuroblasts then can actually um, divide and make um, finally new replacement cells in this case for the olfactory bulb. And if you take a look at this pathway using an actual section which stained up for a nissel stain and stained up to show this layer of stem cells and the, around the ventricular system. So the front of the rat brain is here, the back is there, it's the sagittal section. Um, you can see the pathway. It's not a Mickey Mouse pathway, it's a real pathway. New and mature neuroblasts formed by division of these stem cells and will migrate along this pathway at one millimetre per day. Um, it takes about seven days to get down to the olfactory bulb. Put a lesion here in the cortex to mimic a stroke then they will, they will leave that and go and repair the stroke and make new brain cells or here in the basal ganglia to mimic Huntington's or Parkinson's as they go and leave it there. And they'll form new brain cells to repair the area where you've killed brain cells. So it's pretty exciting. And there's been a lot of interest. So, um, of course, we were told, I was told, used to teach, there's no way the human brain to actually has the same facility. We don't have that layer of stem cells. We don't make new brain cells. Once you reach maturity, you are all brain cells for life. Um, and um, that was a dogma, and that was, that's fine. That's, that's, um, but we found, in fact, you're looking at some of the Huntington's cases, many of the Huntington's cases, we began to see that, you know, in this area which in the rat contains stem cells, we saw in, in cases especially with advanced Huntington's diseases compared with the normal <coughs> here, we found this layer was increased. And what this suggested to us, without going through all the detailed science of it, this suggests the human brain was making new brain cells in response to the injury just in the ether and the striatum, where there's massive cell death in Huntington's disease. So um, I, I began to see this quite regularly. When, once you see something, you think, oh, yes, that's interesting. And I'd run it past some of my colleagues, talk to Mike Dragon, I said, Mike, it looks like we're making new brain cells. He said, no, nah, rubbish. No. But he said, listen. I said, well, have you got any antibodies which show up proliferating brain cells? And he didn't. This is, this is PCNA. This is, the, this is what we've got stained with here. And we used other antibodies too. But ultimately, we actually showed we were making, this is really the work of Morris Curtis, a young PhD student, and then others who came on after, after him um, um, took this further. But we had unequivocal evidence we were making new brain cells. And this is heresy um, for the human brain. So we got that initial result just showing that we were making, um, we got proliferation of stem cells in the human brain, it looked like we were making new brain cells, we got it into PNAS, um, but 
but we knew that not many people believed us, and so we had to search for the equivalent of the pathway which we saw in the rat. If we, if we are doing this, there must be a pathway equivalent to this, what's called the rostral migratory stream in the rat brain. There must be a pathway like this in the human brain if we're going to be, if we're going to have real neurogenesis in the human brain. So Morris, other PhD students, and others, we set out on the search. Human brain's pretty big. We took big blocks of tissue, and we started looking from front to back, sectioning in that way. We saw little hints of the pathway, but it just didn't fit together for one reason or another. We saw little groups of proliferating cells, but we couldn't just put it all together. So we thought, well, we'll do it differently. Instead of cutting in the coronal section, we cut in the sagittal section. So we took large blocks, the largest we could get on our microtone, and instead of going from the front to back, we cut from the midline out. Because if you've got this pathway going from Morton to Wellington, um, cutting across the North Island, you're only going to see hints of it. Cutting along the North Island, you're likely to see a large portion of it. That was a the theory. Um, and so what happened when we, when we did that and then put them all together, we actually found, we found a pathway. And this is what the pathway looked like when we put it all together, going around the front of the basal ganglia, down to the olfactory bulb. It was getting a lot smaller as we got down there. And so for us, this is pretty exciting. So, you know, we, our, our names are going to be up in lights around the world. Well, <coughs> think again. So we put this together, the story together, we sent it to Nature. Two journals in the world, whoever wants, every scientist wants to get artists into Nature and Science. Nature is the UK journal. Science is the US general. So we sent this off to Nature. And of course, they sent it off to three, I think four, four referees. And they were experts in the field. Uh, we got roasted, absolutely roasted, because of course they said there is no such pathway in the human brain. They wouldn't believe it, they wouldn't believe our results unless they could actually, one of them said, well, unless you can keep slices alive in the lab and show these cells migrating, you won't believe it. So we um, said, so, oh, well, OK, well, we've got to, only got one life here. I've got to get this done beforehand. Um, so we then did more work, put more information together, repackaged it, put more cases in, uh, and we did all a whole wide variety of techniques and, and then sent it off to science. And um, fingers crossed to make sure we've got a different set of referees, which we did get. Um, and they came back and they were... It was incredible. So they said, yeah, this is absolutely fascinating, interesting findings. They asked for some changes and additions, which we did. Um, and then we finally got it published. Um, and it got on the front page of Science and got, um, and we got it, and it was incredible. And what's interesting is that um, when we got it published, then the other, other groups who were experts in the field, because we were quite new in this field, you see, they then wrote to the editor and, and they, raised serious questions. Now, when you publish a paper in science, you're restricted to so many words, you can't put everything in you want to. Um, so this particular um, <coughs> referee, um, or reader rather, wrote in and said, listen, I want these questions addressed. And the editor of Science wrote to us and said, listen, you need to answer this. So we were able to actually pull out all that information we couldn't put in the original paper. And we got a second paper of science in and a second uh, paper in, in the next issue of Science actually rebutting and showing that it was true. And since then, a number of labs have actually shown this is, in fact, the real... This is a pathway of neurogenesis in the human brain. It provides a new opportunity. It suddenly means that the human brain can make new brain cells. We do have adult stem cells in the brain. It's, it's revolutionary and incredibly controversial, even still today. Um, it shows us our, our brain is plastic. And it is continuously changing, you see. Every one of you here, you may have heard one thing that you didn't know before, and it's in your brain. That means your brain has changed. And how it's changed, we don't know. But our brains do change. You know, when you think of it, it's pretty obvious. I'm not saying you all made new brain cells. You may have made a few, but the, the, the fact is that our brains are continually changing. And it's now accepted today that our brains are very plastic. That paper in Science was published in 2007, you see. And there's been lots of research since then and, uh, and showing that, in fact, in many respects, we have what's, 
animal, what we've seen in animal studies with this pathway of neurogenesis, we have a comparable pathway in the human brain. Um, we know from animal studies that exercise and stimulation actually results in increased new brain cells. So we can't do that easily in the human brain with the techniques we currently have. But we can extrapolate, extrapolate that to the human brain and say, well, you know, exercise stimulation of your brain in whatever form. In the rat that was found stimulating rats by putting them in cages with lots of things to do, different things, different combinations of things, they would actually make um, you know, 25% more brain cells. If you exercise them, they make about the same, depending on the amount of exercise. If you stress them in their exercise, they actually make less brain cells. So it suddenly showed us a, a new property of the human brain which we never realised, which dogma has said we couldn't do. We didn't have that facility because our brain was far too complicated. And so I would like to think that creative thinking makes new brain cells. The more you think, the more, I mean, it's a, um, and it enhances your brain, you know, it's just use it or lose it is a, is a sort of a, it's a pretty logical sort of conclusion. And, and in a way, you can't do research to actually show a lot of these things, but the implications, you always, you always got to dream, you always got to push your results out a bit. As long as you say that it's actually speculation, it's fine, um, but it's um, what it's all about. Second example, talking to Russell Snell when he came back to join us from overseas and he, he's in the School of Biological Professor down there, one of the world's experts on Huntington's disease, the Huntington's gene. And when Russell came back as a senior research fellow um, with the Wellcome Trust and he came into my office and said, you know, we should look at seeing if we can put the human brain, the human gene for Huntington's inside the, rat, inside the sheep brain and see if we can create a transgenic sheep model of Huntington's disease because the sheep brain is much more comparable to the human brain whereas they had done this in the rat but only put a little small portion of the Huntington's gene. So I really did think he was dreaming but 25 years later after that, we got support from the Freemasons over the interim years, um, uh, working with our colleagues at Boston who had um, the human HD gene of 73 repeats. We, we, got the, we, we got the transcript for that. We injected it, and this is cutting. This is Jesse Jacobson's marvellous work over the years. Um, we ended up in working with a, um, a, a research institute in Adelaide, the, South Australian Research Development Institute, which was specifically um, developed by the government there to create transgenic sheep models of different diseases. So we actually created, with their expert help, a um, transgenic model for Huntington's disease, injecting the human HD gene with 73 repeats. It's above the uh, pathological range, and then developed lines of, um, of sheep over the years six lines initially and cut down to one line and um, so this is uh, six years ago now we developed the line that's line that's now been used to study first do we see the sheep developing Huntington's disease the answer is not the overt disease but we see early changes and now the sheep's being used to see if we can use and develop interference RNAi and other types of uh, nucleotides to actually inhibit that development so this together with other groups overseas working in other animal models, has provided the basis whereby right now there is a clinical trial starting this year. Richard Roxburgh is a New Zealand um, um, representative in it. We've got patients who have got hunting, early Huntington's in New Zealand, part of the six, group of 1,600 people who we're trialling this um, um, genetic suppression technique by injecting into the cerebrospinal fluid and seeing whether we can slow down and decrease the expression of the gene and possibly slow down the onset and progression of the disease. For people with Huntington's disease, that is it. I'll just give you a real general overview there. This is, this is an incredible situation. And what's, what's so good about this is why I like to show this example is that you know, the Huntington's families gave us the brains um, with the hope that we would somehow, through research, which I could not have imagined then, we could have actually contributed to something which could be a cure for them. And um, this is shown, this has got the whole 
world excited. It's not just our work, it's all collaborative research around the world got to the stage of having a clinical trial now to see whether or not we can actually slow down and possibly even stop the progression of that disease and that's going to be marvellous. And the, so, and the final third example I just want to tell you about is what we've been doing with the neurosurgeons and by working closely with the neurosurgeons and, and establishing a close collaboration and we've had an investment from the Freemasons from many others to actually help support this, we are taking tissue which comes off the operating table, whether it be tissue for people who have had um, temporal um, lobectomies for epilepsy, or tissue which has been taken from tumours or other specimens during the course of a neurosurgical operation with the, with the consent of course for the patients who, and the families who, who are so eager to help in any way at all, and we take that tissue into the lab, and this is Mike Dragonos work and his whole team, and we can um, take that tissue, we can, by using enzymatic digestion after dicing it down, we can digest it, we can, we can separate it into individual neurons, and we can actually culture cells from the human brain, keep them alive so that we can do studies on them. So this is just examples from a um, studies from post-mortem tissue actually showing showing cells kept alive, dispersed in a cult tradition in the lab from a normal brain. And this is from, the next one is from a, a brain from uh, where tissue has been received for epilepsy, but we can do also do for Huntington's and Alzheimer's and so on. So you, we can actually grow, keep brain cells alive in the dish, human brain cells, and we're using that now to look at developing drug treatment by trialling drugs in the dishes. This is sort of, a, sort of like a disease in the dish in the, in, the, in the most exciting way to see whether we're screening large libraries of compounds to see if we can slow down the cell death or stop the dividing or whatever so that we can have a possible treatment for Huntington for any of these diseases with epilepsy, Huntington's or whatever. It's a big program, it's getting off the ground and it's getting pretty amazing. So um, it's one of my slides showing that we can actually isolate most of the different types of cells, um, glial cells and brain cells in the, in the human brain. It's pretty complicated. We can also keep human neurons alive, which are done from the cerebellum, and you can test things directly on, on um, living dispersed neurons, which are in the dish in the lab. So for me, this is a dream come true. Um, and uh, so it's all about teamwork, nothing to do, uh, I've been fortunate to be involved, we just bring people together so that they do this, you see, but to get all the different groups in the university who can combine in ways to, to, to produce results you could never dream of is marvellous and so to do this is one of the things we've, it's been really critical, we've had to develop new platforms like all that cell growing of human brain cells, we do that in what's called the biobank. We have to get additional funding from groups who are outside the normal funding streams to do this research. Often it's innovative, it's risky research, and so we are so fortunate by actually going out and involving and talking to different groups, and they've often come to talk to us and say, how can we help your research? And so we've created different platforms. The brain bank was funded by a Neurological Foundation, the Hugh Green Biobank, the Biobank Growing Brain Cells, it's, it's the Hugh Green Trust, He's a, he, um, Hugh Green died some years ago, a marvellous Irishman, they, it's an engineering company, and um, they, I got an email one day and said, he said, oh, someone on our board says we should try and help you, um, can we come along and just have a talk? And so, literally it was a, it was a two-liner from John Green, so came along, had a discussion, took them and show what we do and they said, well, you know, being an engineer, we would like to help you with these growing human brain cells. And now, they've been funding us now for nine years and we're up to this stage and we're going to meet, in, the, in fact, next week and talk about the next, um, next group of funding to go on and develop this even further. Uh, neurodiscovery research platform, we've had a, this is, look, this is developing techniques to use on the animal brain, we have a variety of funders there. I'm going to go through very quickly. We've got a spinal cord injury unit, which Louise Nicholson was the driving force behind that. The Catwalk Trust supported, Catwalk Trust supported that. 
Stroke Recovery Clinic has been free racing support at Salon Barber. Dementia Prevention Research Clinics, this is where we take people with the early stages of Alzheimer's, and this is with our core brain research New Zealand, and we're looking to see if we can slow down the progression of Alzheimer's by going in the early stages, seeing if we get, if we get, if we can bring a combination of different treatments together. Um, from this cohort, we need to have 400 cases um, enrolled in this, and we're well down that line. It's a long-term study um, of our core, and it's going into we putting another application into extend it now, but that's going really well. We don't have a cure for dementia. We know the factors which we can slow it down, so there's a lot of opportunity to do that for disease, which is affecting you know uh, 70,000 people in New Zealand now, and and 150,000 in 2020. It's a it's a huge um, <coughs> challenge for the ageing population. Motor neurone disease. We've got Emma Scott are driving that, and that's funded by Freemasons and funded by other trusts, the Duncan Trust. Um, Neurosurgery Research Unit funded by um, Douglas Trust and, and Freemasons. And then we've got the HD transgenic sheet that was funded by the Freemasons. You see, Freemasons made a huge impact. Um, postdoctoral Research Fellows funded especially by the Aotearoa, the uh, Robinson Foundation in New York. Um, and Sir David Levine last year gave us the support to create a chair in brain research. So ultimately, when I when I do step down, we've guaranteed that the chair which I have, which is in anatomy, will continue forever for the director, future director of brain research. And um, so we've um, together. It's about we get about three million dollars a year. It's not the figure that that is important. It's actually well, it is important, but it's the involvement of the people who believe in you, and we have a personal relationship with every group, and that is what makes the difference. So um, we're all partners in our brain research. You see. Um, so, um, acknowledgements, well I can't name everyone involved, I can just say the groups of people. So, um, the people who have made the huge difference in the course of the patients and the families, through brain donation, and you get to see the impact which brain diseases make on families, and you get to have an understanding of that, and for that it helps us to move our research forward in the most special way. The Medical and Health Research Council, I began my first research project in 1978 funded by the Medical Research Council, subsequently took over by the Health Street Solving, had continuous funding for 41 years, which is incredible, program grant funding for 25, Neurological Foundation of New Zealand, other than AMRF, CHDI, which is an American Trust and the Wellcome Trust and so on. But the program grant research team, this is our team of... Um, researchers, both in my group and other groups. I personally have had 65 PhDs and 45 masters over the years. Um, they are the people that make it happen. The graduate, graduate students are the engine house of brain research. And what's interesting, they actually, uh, within the centre, we try and get them to talk and interact with each other. They do it very well. They do it better than what the PIs do. And so through the Early Career Researchers Committee, through different initiatives, they get together and they actually collaborate amazingly and talk and actually help us promote our multidisciplinary research. And of course, the international collaborators are absolutely vital. This is just a group that we've worked with, particularly on Huntington's disease across um, the UK, um, across the continent and across the United States and Canada. So all personal friends developed over over many years and um, they do work and we send tissue to them to do research with the family's consent that we can't do in New Zealand and so we have ended up with this big international family and that's got to be the most exciting thing out and um, so um, research is about team collaboration I'll just give you a very general overview but this, you know, science is always about people never forget that um, and for me that's 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 uh, so my journey so far has been unexpectedly exciting. And um, the students uh, make it happen. The graduate students are the most special people in the world. The families, of course, are critical. So I often get calls over the weekend or any time. We always tell our donor families, ring us at any time if we can help. And they just ring up and they had one call on a Christmas day. And, and they said, all the family are here. And we just, you know, Dad died last year. We gave the brain to you. We just want to know where research is going. And, <laughs> you know, an hour later, 
and you know you've transformed that family. <clears throat> Tell them about this new possible treatment for Huntington's disease, this transformational. And, and um, you come away from those phone calls and you say, I'm just lucky to be alive and to actually be involved with this sort of research. So that's really what the story is that I wanted to convey to you today. So thank you very much for listening. Happy to take any questions or <coughs> if there are any. Yes. You raised a, a topical and subtle issue to do with ethics and yep. the management of that. Auckland Hospital Board had a massive inquiry many yep. years ago. Yep. How did that change the methodologies <coughs> of practices and maybe the codes that you are? Very, well, very you, a great question, developed. actually. <coughs> so <coughs> that was the Cartwright inquiry. And so in my early years, it was generally understood that the coroner had full jurisdiction over the body. And in law, he did. And so we would receive tissue with the coroner's permission and consent in the very early years. Um, that was n mainly normal tissue. All the, all the tissue from families with a brain disease, the families donated it to you, see. So you had all the consent absolutely protected there. And so when the Cartwright inquiry came along, it became very clear that coroner's consent was actually unacceptable. So we then, then we then got money from the university, who very kindly funded a post, and we had a person in the mortuary who calls up all the <coughs> all the families of people who, who have died, who have come to the post-mortem, and get permission to use tissue for research. And so that... It, that completely changed it all. So what was interesting is that when they rewrote the Human Tissue Act, they came along to see me and discuss, <clears throat> they said, how we need to rewrite this act to bring it up to current thinking and to reflect what the, the concerns in the community. So they said, just how do you do this? And so it was interesting that in an unconscious way, we had developed a way of gaining consent which stood, which stood all the scrutiny you could expect, actually, and that was used partly as the model to actually develop and to revise the, act, the Human Tissue Act in 2008, which now operates. And part of the spin-off of that is our human transplant program. Yep. So it's so uh, yeah, it has. A, so you never know. You see, if um, with our human brain bank, if someone has said, "Listen, starting a human brain bank today," I, I would, you wouldn't know where to start. So you see, we just started in an unconscious way. And then realising after 10 years that we were, we were developing a collection of human tissue in partnership with the families. And so I thought, well, and we are funding this out of our HRC research grants. And I thought, well, I'll just talk to Neurological Foundation because, you know, they were interested in promoting research. Perhaps if we call it the Neurological Foundation Human Brain Bank, they would give us some funding. And cut a long story short, they did. Uh, Philip Wrightson was the medical director then, as neuro, he was a neurosurgeon. And so, um, and that has continued and grown now. And so we started off with one staff, now we've got four staff. So, yeah. Bruce. Bruce, just really an uh, extension of that. Um, the, I want to just comment on the way in which you've engaged with Maori community, mm. given that for them, particularly the brain, yeah. is, a, is a critical. So, again, so <coughs> interesting. Um, so my, my family, we, 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 are, um, we go back and we, we with um, links with um, Ngāti Rahiri, Te Atiara and Taranaki and I, just, I discovered that 15 years ago. Um, and out of that has grown a, a fantastic relationship. We actually go down to Taranaki about two or three times a year to talk to different groups down there and our extended whānau who have Huntington's seats. But we have had donors, Maori donors, come and they said, listen, we would like to bequeath the brain. And the first case was actually the husband. He was European and he wanted to give his brain to the brain bank. His wife was uh, Maori. And uh, for their family, they wanted to do this. So I said, well, I said, I think you should take this to your, to your whanau, then to your iwi, and discuss it well in advance of his death, and that, which they did do. So... So they actually worked out a way that was culturally accepted and the, and the thing which is really important, I say we, we are the custodians of the brain. 
The brain is actually belongs to the far no, the family forever, and we're just using it in research. Um, and we return it ultimately if that's what they wish. Uh, so they worked out a process which we now use where you consult with... Um, we've gone out, we, we, we go on to Morai, we stay there over the weekend, we have our Māori students want to do research project, we have a lot of consultation, and it's grown in the most marvellous way by engagement. And, of course, the willing has to be there on the Māori side to do this. And actually it is. When you've got, when you've got brain disease which are caused by genes which are going to change and affect your, your whānau forever, they have, a, um, they have a commitment which is absolutely incredible to helping you. And so we've had whānau come in and they come into the brain bank and they'll um, say prayers, they'll say whakanaa over the freezer. Um, and it's the most moving thing we ever do. For our Māori students, we have particular protocols which we developed, which you need to keep, we keep looking at, of, of how we can help in the system through contact with Māori, through, through prayers and, uh, that they say over the tissue in order to make it acceptable. So it's taken us on a journey which has been challenging in many ways, but most exciting, and we have a blessing, a Māori blessing of our rain bank once a year. How about other cultures? Because we're now coming up with a multicultural yeah. theme. Yeah, so we're, well, we've yet to, uh, we we'll just go through it the same way, you know. We're, so we don't have a prescription for all cultures, but if there's, if there's any cultural, um, if there's any cultural issues, then we are guided by them, basically. We go to, uh, refer to ours, we, so we have a Māori advisory committee, and, um, and so there's, there is a, we don't have a textbook published on this, but there is a process of consultation, which if you go through and make sure you listen and engage with whatever community who wants to become involved. So we don't approach them, they approach us. Uh, that's critical. Yes? So um, I was interested in the uh, cell culturing that yep. you were doing. Um, you know, in, in cultures, the, uh, um, the cells are in quite different sort of Yep, absolutely. Yeah. How, how much correspondence is there between the behaviour of cells in, the, in a culture? Well, it's, pretty, it's a pretty hard question to answer. We're, we're trying to develop also slice cultures. Um, and um, the fact is that they are, are cells of the human phenotype. Um, the fact is we can address issues there. You see, one of the problems we have in, um, well, in Alzheimer's and any of the diseases Treatments generated out of purely rat studies um, don't always work in humans. Uh, and the differences are massive. So, uh, uh, of course, the, the environment's different. It's as, it's, it's as close as we can get at this stage. Um, so we just go with um, what we can do. So, Mike Dragunov is the person to talk about, but uh, to you about that. But it's a... Um, it's an issue we've always got to consider, of course. Yes? Um, I have a couple of questions yep. about uh, neuroplasticity. Um, so why, uh, so the first question is, why is it plastic and not elastic? Why is it not neuroelastic? So that's the that's engineering of the community. Mm -hmm. And the other one um, is also um, about the recovery from like, brain injury. How much of it is due to neurogenesis and yep. how much of it is due to the brain rewiring itself? Are there sure. Well, <clears throat> um, so you can use the term plastic or elastic. The, the point we're trying to say is that, and it's really interesting, I mean, just reinforces what we find in animals that, in fact, cell neurons are continually changing. When, when, you, when, you, when you're growing, you know, slices of animal, of, 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 um, animal brain tissue, and you're looking at individual neurons, you can see the dendrites, um, and when you're looking at connections, you can see that um, the receptor population is changing, the actual branching of the dendrites does change, um, and to think that brain cells in your brain have an architecture which is completely permanent forever is actually generally considered now to be a load of rubbish. The, the, um, uh, and that it changes, you know, dendritic profiles change according to the 
um, according to the connections which are established, those which are those which are being activated and those which are not being activated. So, so brain architecture, brain physiology is a huge amount of evidence now showing it is a constantly changing um, for every neuron which depends <coughs> on the current circuitry and the pattern of stimulation. I mean, different parts of the brain we know, you can rewire the brain. We know that by taking, um, doing functional MRI scans of different people and different modes of activity have had a long-term activity. I mean, comparing the brain of a violinist, for example, on one side of the brain and the other, and looking at the representation of the different limbs, you know, you, you actually have you do different things with each hand. There is a difference in the architecture, subtle, but it's there. Um, so everything points to the fact that there is more plasticity, more ongoing plasticity in the human brain than we ever gave it credit for. And that it's constantly changing in every way. And uh, the fact is, when you, you know, when you think back, every year we're advancing. You, you, every person is changing their knowledge base, changing their whole experience of life, gaining new ideas and all the rest of it. So that's being laid down in ways which we can't measure. Um, and so there is. So the term plasticity is used to really imply that there is. Um, the brain is not a permanent structure which just shows the same pattern in terms of both structure and function from here to the rest of your life. It is actually it is subject to all of the inputs coming in um, in every single way. Um, take off if a person loses their limb, you know that that part of the motor cortex will actually will be will be taken over and used by other parts of the body. Um, the same with a um, person who's blind. We, we just know that there is that sort of change taking place in, in what we can measure in terms of organisational structure of the brain. So um, in the early years, uh, you know, um, I would have always said, you know, unless you can prove everything by science, don't believe it. As you, as you become more mature, you become um, less... You become more holistic and less dogmatic. Science is absolutely critical. But also there's, this, there's a certain aspect on brain function which is out there which you just got to go with. Um, not necessarily say it's, it's, it's permanent fact, but just showing that we can make new brain cells. We can't say, for example, as a, your second question was, how much, of a, how much of a role neurogenesis plays in the human brain in terms of repair versus plasticity love to be out, but you, you can't do those experiments in the human. We can transpose it from the, from the rat brain and we can say the facility is there. So the facility to change and adapt and improve your brain forever, I mean we know that neurogenesis is probably going to be decreased with increasing age, but nevertheless, see all the normal brains that we studied were in the 60s and 70s for that, for that study we did, that's for the tissue we had for the normal brain. So. Um, which is amazing. So yes, you got you got to sort of. There is a certain part of the science where you just go with the flow, and you think, "Yep, okay." In the meantime, until we can develop techniques to prove this, don't deny this possibility. Yep. So the, the so the Auckland to Wellington motorway. Yep. Motorway. Yeah. Yeah. Is there only one? And yep. so there's only one motorway. And what happens in the? Okay, so what's really interesting is that this, um, when you look at this, this is an extension of the, that subventricular zone containing the stem cells, adult stem cells around the ventricles. Um, that um, when you look at the mammalian brain, that um, you see in the typical mammalian brain, your olfactory bulb was at one end and your spinal cord at the other. And so it was a longitudinal brain. In the human brain, I didn't actually mention this, but in the human brain, the, um, because of the huge development of the forebrain, you have actually changed that sort of um, um, uh, organisation. So that's why our neurogenesis motorway, our rostral motorway, is, is different because of the huge development of the forebrain and the basal, it's it distorted that motorway. When we go back down through the um, ventricular system, there are hints of other pathways coming off which we still have to investigate, which go to other areas. So um, we can't do experiments on living human brain and as you go down we know there's still stem cells which lie around the central canal of the spinal cord, not nearly in the same way as around the ventricles in the brain. 
So um, there is the, the concept that when the brain becomes fully mature, we still have stem cells around the ventricular, central ventricular system, which goes throughout the nervous system. The extension going up into the olfactory bulb, originally the lateral ventricle used to go right up there, you see. And when this can become compressed, when we look at it, I didn't talk about this, but when we look at that rostral migrating stream in the human, you can see the collapsed extension of the ventricular system, which is no longer present in the adult. And so that rostral migrating stream is really an extension. It's really the collapsed, it represents in part the collapsed um, layer of um, subventricular zone, which would have been present around that original ventricular system. So the fact that there is migration is really attracting a whole lot. There's so much work being done about all the factors which are controlling it to see if we can promote that in terms of different types of brain disease or different types of injury. Long way to go yet. Uh, but the, the point is that we've got stem cells in our human brain which belong to each one of you, which can be utilised and stimulated in ways for brain repair, potential repair, without having to go to take, um, um, you know, stem cell transplants from an embryo or whatever. And we know that there's huge problems in taking stem cells and trying to stimulate and make new brain cells because, of course, it's a highly specialised system, unlikely to produce new brain cells in exactly the architecture you want. They will never produce brain cells which will replace a particular cell that's lost in a disease. With the same pattern, each brain cell gets about 10,000 to 120,000 connections. So a, brain, a new brain cell is not going to be useful unless it gets all the connections. So there's a few challenges there. So we don't know what's going on in the olfactory bulb once the stem cells are transported there? Okay. No, no, we, we, we can't do that. We can't do those sort of functional studies in the human. The, the plasticity there is enormous. Um, uh, so we, we, ha we can't do time course studies on the human brain. There's lots of people who are looking at trying to do that in one way or another. Morris Curtis is continuing that. Unfortunately, that has to be our last question because already 10 past 5. So let's thank Sir Richard one more time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.